Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, also your local technical consultant for Altium. And today we are gonna be doing a buck converter simulation. So what we are gonna look at in this simulation is of course the overall operation and performance of this buck converter, but also some ways that people may use to try and reduce the switching noise from this type of converter. These are things that you can do in the circuit design phase when you're building a buck converter in order to try and reduce the switching noise. So that's what we're gonna look at in this video. If you haven't gotten your free trial of Altium Designer, go get your free copy and follow along. All right, let's get started. Okay, so let's take a look at this buck converter circuit. So here on my screen, I've created a buck converter. We've got two MOSFETs here. You can see here with these uh, pulse sources, these are uh, mimicking the PWM signal that would be used to drive these two transistors. We've got a reasonably large inductor here, and then we've got our output capacitor. And then here, the load is only a 10 ohm load. Um, we could make it bigger if we wanted to, but we're just gonna work with a 10 ohm load for now. And then here on the input, Puts. We've got a 25 volt DC source and based on the duty cycle, we are trying to step down to about uh, seven volts, I believe. So if you just look at the pulse width and the pulse period, you can see here we've got a three microsecond uh, pulse width, 10 microsecond pulse period. So that's basically a hundred kilohertz PWM frequency. And if I just bring up my calculator here, we're gonna have 30% uh, times 25 volts we'd expect about 7.5 volts on the output. When you create a simulation like this, first thing to do is run over here to the simulation dashboard. I've got it placed as a panel, but you could of course drag it off here and have it as a window if you want. Just click the update button to verify. It's gonna check to make sure that you're satisfying all electrical rules and that there are simulation models attached to each of these components. Uh, here the prep, you can select some sources and probes. And then here we're gonna select our different analyses that we wanna run. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run this so you can see what's going on and we can see what the performance of this buck converter is. So you see it finishes pretty quickly. Um, you can see here, just from looking at the inductor current, if I zoom in, never drops down to zero. It's actually pretty good uh, current here. We're looking at uh, almost an amp. Yeah, so about half amp to an amp switching current. So that's pretty high swing, um, but it is running in the continuous mode. And then you can see here with the voltage, we're just a little under our target of uh, 7.5 volts or about 7.5 volts. So pretty good here. So this is the basic operation of our buck converter. And you can see here, on the output voltage, what our switching noise is. So we've actually got a pretty good amount of switching noise. So if I just zoom in here, you can see here at my peak, I've got about 6.9 volts. And here at the, uh, the valley, we've got about 7.2 volts. So that's about 300 millivolts peak to peak. So that's pretty big, right? 150 millivolts amplitude or 300 millivolts peak to peak. So pretty big switching noise. The question always arises when you are doing a buck converter simulation, what can you do to try and reduce switching noise? Because the ideal buck converter will have this uh, swing on the output voltage as small as possible. That's what we wanna look at. So this uh, buck converter uh, inductor you can see is operating in the continuous mode. Um, one thing that you could try to do is actually increase the inductance because the peak-to-peak -peak ripple is going to be inversely proportional to the size of this inductor. So if we wanted to essentially take that uh, ripple and divide it by three, let's say, we could basically triple the value of this inductor and we would expect about uh, a third of the noise. And so let's just do that real quick, just for fun. If we actually do this, what do we get? So you can see we do get a lot smaller noise. And just zooming in here, you can see we've cut that noise to almost, yeah, pretty much a third, right? It's just about 100 millivolts peak to peak. So that kind of proves out the method here that just increasing the inductance when you're already in the continuous mode is gonna reduce that switching noise. So the problem with that strategy is that eventually you run out of room for that inductor. And what I mean by that is you have to keep making the inductor larger and larger physically in order to reduce the switching noise further. 
you would like to use a larger inductor, but it can't be too large because otherwise just the physical size of your circuit gets too big. Also the cost and the weight and the size of those inductors is too large. So it doesn't make much sense at some point to go beyond a certain value for the inductance in this output inductor. So what else can you do? Well, one thing that you can do is you can increase the switching frequency. So the output ripple is also inversely proportional to the switching frequency. If you were to increase that switching frequency, you can actually get this ripple to go down farther. Now, uh, increasing the switching frequency is pretty much the trend that is used in small form factor buck converters or small form factor switching converters generally. Opt for maybe megahertz switching frequencies. So that's gonna decrease the ripple by about a factor 10. Another strategy when you can't keep increasing the switching frequency and you can't keep increasing the inductance is to use a filter. Now, filters on the output of a switching element like a buck converter are actually a bit difficult to design. It's not that they're hard to design, it's just that the parameters need to be chosen correctly so that you don't create a new instability by adding in a reactive filter in this design. What type of filter could we put on here? Well, the standard filter that you would put on here is essentially just a pi filter. So let's just suppose for a moment that we add in another cap here and we add in another inductor. And let's just say for a moment we make this 6.8 microhenries and we make this capacitor, uh, let's say, we'll leave it at 2.2 microfarads. We'll go ahead and change the designators real quick. And now we can go ahead and go back in and run the simulation. So whenever you make a change to this schematic, you just need to make sure that you update the verification. Obviously it's gonna pass very quickly. And then we'll just go ahead and run this again so we can see what happens. So if you remember previously, all right, we had a situation where, in fact, let me just undo this so you can see. If you uh, look at the previous simulation results, we had a transient response that looks like this and it goes out pretty far. And then we have the switching noise superimposed on top of that. Once we add back in all of these other elements in our filter and we run this again, you'll notice that this transient response actually extends a little bit. And this transient response does creep into this longer portion of the turn on time. So you can see here on the X axis here at the far end, we have one millisecond uh, time scale here. Once we added in these filtering elements, we do actually get a nice reduction here in the switching noise. So just zooming in here, you can see that the switching noise is down to just about 80 millivolts peak to peak. So that's pretty good, but maybe you need to get it lower. Here though, you can see that this transient response is actually extended quite a bit. So one strategy that you might use here instead of just a 6.8 microhenry inductor, let's say we increase that by a factor 10. What's gonna happen? Well, if we go back and run the simulation again, you can see here, now we've got a trade-off going on when we start to add in this filter. You can see here, when we actually look at the long end here, that we have really nice low switching noise. So here in this view, it's about six millivolts. That's really good for switching noise. However, you can also see that we have some transient behavior here that actually extends out very far. And in fact, when I zoomed in here, if you look very closely, you can kind of see how there's this transient decay that's still going on with this filter circuit. So this filter is still causing instability in the output voltage from this circuit. So that's one of the challenges of adding in a filter on the output of a buck converter is that you don't want to add in a new pole to the transfer function for this circuit. So that's the challenge here. Now here we've added in a new pole and you can actually see its transient response very clearly when we make this inductor really large. How do we deal with that transient response? Well, here we have an underdamped oscillation that is being superimposed on the other underdamped oscillation from these two filter elements, so L1 and C1. And then we have the regular transient response from both of those two uh, being superimposed and giving us this kind of combination transient response. So that's actually very common in linear systems. What do we do about this? Well, there's a few elements that we haven't included in this simulation and that is the effective series resistance or the equivalent series resistance 
of these capacitors. The inductor will also have some series resistance because of the coil or the, wind, the, the coil that makes up the inductor windings. That will also have some resistance um, because copper is not a perfect conductor. But normally what we do in this type of simulation is we just look at the capacitor portion. So I'm just gonna copy over this resistor. I'm gonna change up the, uh, the reference designators and then I'm gonna change the values here. So we're just gonna go with a very small resistance here, one ohm. And I'll explain why in just a moment. When we add in just a little bit of resistance here for this uh, C2 and C1 capacitors, what do we see? Well, we can run this simulation again. And so now you can see that one of the transient responses has been nicely damped. And that was that slightly higher frequency transient response that's associated with L2 and C2. So this filter portion. So if you calculate the resonant frequency of this circuit, just using the one over L2 C2 value, you can then figure out uh, that this portion will have a higher frequency pole than this portion, and together they produce that transient response that you saw earlier. You can very nicely see that right here at the beginning, um, we've got a nice dampening effect on that transient response. So that is one of the challenges with placing filters, is to not create a new instability in the output from that circuit by adding in that filter. One way to do that is to make sure that you account for the series resistance on these capacitors. Now essentially what you've done here is you have placed a snubber circuit. So this RC circuit in series is sometimes called a snubber circuit. And this snubber circuit um, essentially slows down the response of this capacitor by in adding in some damping. And essentially what we've done is we have converted the transient response from an underdamped response to uh, probably something closer to a critically damped response. Now, why this value of one here? Why does this need to be so small? I think it's natural for someone to look at this circuit and say, hey, shouldn't this be a larger resistor? Don't I need a longer time constant here? I think it's reasonable to think that because typically when you see RC circuits, they do have a somewhat larger resistor and then a smaller capacitor. And then together that gives you uh, the RC response that you're looking for. But um, typically what happens is when you put these capacitors here, they're already gonna have a little bit of series resistance, right? So the leads on the capacitor package and then of course the leads on the PCB combined to give you some total series resistance. So you have the effective series resistance from the capacitor, and then you have the series resistance from the pads where the capacitor is mounted. And so together, that is usually on the order of milliohms. So just by adding in just a little bit of resistance or a little bit of additional resistance here on these capacitors, you are uh, then converting this response into a somewhat more damped response and you are removing one of those transients. Now, what happens if we take, let's say, this capacitor and we make it much larger? Let's say we make it a 10 ohm resistor. Same thing here, make this a 10 ohm resistor. So let's just remember this window for just a second because we can see what this looks like. And then I'm gonna go into my simulation here and I'm gonna rerun this and we can really see what's going on here. Wow, now we've got a big effect on switching noise, right? So we managed to dampen that really big overshoot that we saw earlier. We saw that overshoot because this was still small and we were still getting a really nice damping effect on the switching noise. But now, if we make those resistors too big, you can see here that, yeah, we've dampened that initial overshoot, but now the switching noise came back. Why did the switching noise come back? Well, the switching noise is oscillating at high frequency and you have eliminated the ability of these capacitors to respond quick enough to dampen that high frequency noise. And so if we just zoom in here and look at what the, uh, the response here is, almost back to 300 uh, millivolts, actually a little more than 300 millivolts uh, switching noise. So too much resistance in these filter circuits is actually bad. Keep that in mind, if you have a buck converter and you are trying to add in some filtering on the output, if you don't design that filter correctly, you will actually create a new noise problem or create excessive power loss on the output due to the placement of those resistors. Smaller resistance is better. Remember, your capacitors are already gonna have a little bit of ESR on them, but just a little bit more, maybe an ohm, maybe two ohms, is probably all you're gonna need in order to be able to compensate for that switching noise. Now, there's one other source of noise that actually isn't being included in this simulation because it isn't in the uh, transistor models. Also, we didn't include an inductor to account for that parasitic. And that is the inductance of the leads and the pads 
where the capacitors are mounted. And I'll just give you the answer for how to deal with that now, but the way that you would solve that problem is you would then put another snubber circuit uh, basically right here. So you would wanna make this C a bit smaller because we're dealing with high frequency ringing in that case. So something like 22 nanofarads. Um, and then your resistor is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of again, you know, a couple of ohms, maybe one to three ohms. And that's what's gonna dampen the ringing response on the switching node due to the uh, inductance of the transistor packages when they switch as they're driven by these PWM signals. So watch out for our next video on buck converter simulations where we look at that circuit design problem because that one is also a lot of fun and it deals with parasitics that you really can't overcome in the transistor package. You can do a little bit about it in the PCB layout, but honestly, the best solution is probably gonna to be to put one of these small snubber circuits across the low side transistor. All right, everybody, that's all I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to keep up with all of our latest videos. Make sure to hit that like button if you like the video. And of course, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. Make sure to send your questions over to YouTube at altium.com. And last but not least, everybody, make sure to get your free copy of Altium Designer. You can follow along with all of our tutorial videos. And finally, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time.